Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Nadia Kaneva, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies here at the University of Denver. And together with my partner and co-organizer of this event, Dr. Andrea Stanton from the Department of Religious Studies, we want to welcome you to this research presentation and discussion on understanding ISIS media and communication perspectives. If you are following the news at all, uh, you know that ISIS has reared its ugly head um, in the headlines again just recently um, re in relation to the horrific attacks in Sri Lanka. And this talk, when we originally planned it, was not intended to be a talk about current events or any response to immediate things going on um, in the world. But it was more intended to help us think in conceptual terms about apprehending the ISIS phenomenon. What is it really that we're looking at here? And how do media and communication relate to this phenomenon? I do want to quote, however, uh, from a recent opinion piece in the New York Times written by Middle East historian Fawaz Gergis, who wrote that the first factor that engenders the Islamic State is the organic crisis of governance and ungovernable spaces that plagues Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Egypt, Sinai Peninsula, West Africa, and Afghanistan. So we also need to think about this crisis of governance along with the various processes related to mediation. We are very happy and fortunate to have two outstanding speakers with us and scholars um, who will be sharing their research with you. Uh, but before I turn it over to my colleague to introduce them, I just want to thank a few people for making this event possible. Um, first of all, we are very grateful to have received a Dean's Award for Interdisciplinary Studies from the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, which has funded this event, but it's also been supporting an interdisciplinary research project that, I, uh, that Andrea and I are working on, on the mediation of statehood in relation to ISIS. We also want to thank um, our respective departments for their continuing support. And the Center for Middle East Studies here at the Corbell School, um, uh, directed by Professor Nader Hashimi, and also Gina for all of her kind assistance in getting all the logistics work worked out. Um, special thanks also to Professor Debbie Avant, um, from the Corbell School and professors Margie Thompson and Christoph Demann Heinrich from the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies for incorporating this lecture into their classes and giving you all an opportunity to hear some fascinating research. With that, I'll turn it over to Andrea. Hi, we're so glad. If you're sitting on the floor, sometimes that is lovely. Um, if you feel like sitting right straight in center, there are two seats in the front in case you actually, there's one slightly on the corner in the front if that uh, <coughs> engages your stage fright slightly. Oh, nope, that one just let went. Um, so anyway, but we're also happy to have you on the floor. And I have the delightful uh, task of introducing our colleagues and speakers. So our first speaker will be Nabil Shaibi, who is chair and associate professor of media studies and the Associate Director of the Center for Media, Religion, and Culture up at our neighbors um, in Boulder, the University of Colorado Boulder. And his research focuses on religion and the role of media in shaping and reflecting modern religious identities among Muslims in the Middle East and in Western societies. His work on diasporic media, Muslim media cultures, and Islamic alternative modernity have appeared in various journals, including the Journal of Intercultural Studies, Nations and Nationalism, the Journal of Arab and Muslim Media Research, Media Development, and in numerous book volumes. He's the author of Voicing Diasporas, 
Ethnic Radio in Paris and Berlin Between Culture and Renewal, and the co-editor of International Blogging, Identity, Politics, and Network Publics. And he's currently working on two book projects, Unmasking Islam, Media, Popular Culture, and Muslim Modernities, and The Transparent Muslim, Muslims Between the Blackmail of Visibility and the Right to Opacity. And our second speaker, Karim El Damanhuri, is an Egyptian academic and journalist. He has a PhD in communication from Georgia State University and is currently a postdoctoral research associate in the communication department there. He's also a content producer at CNN International in Atlanta. His research focuses on the use of media in times of conflict, emerging proto-state media systems, and news framing. And Karim's work has been published in various journals, including Media, War, and Conflict, the Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media, the Journal of Terrorism and Political Violence, and this fall he will be coming back to Denver to join DU's Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies as Assistant Professor of Journalism. We're delighted to have you both here. So just to let you know the order of things today, um, we will have each speaker uh, present for about 25 minutes, after which we will have an open discussion with questions from the floor. So please um, hold your questions until that moment, and then we will have a conversation with both speakers at the same time. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, okay. thank you very much for being here today. So since I have a lot of ground that I need to cover, so I wanna start first by asking two very quick questions. Um, they are actually inspired by a recent research article that came out just a few months back. Um, it was a study conducted on a US representative sample and it found that 25% of respondents had seen or come across a snippet or the entire video, a beheading video of ISIS, um, whether this is just a screen grab on in the in mainstream media or a video shared online, any part or a snippet of a video. So I'm just wondering on a raise of hands, how many people have come across any snippet of a beheading video before? So on the other hand, what about any video or image of uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda delivering social services, education or uh, food aid to locals. So one here. So that latter part is actually what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how ISIS and Al-Qaeda are actually projecting an image of them as emerging states or as caliphate projects. So what is so what is a caliphate? A caliphate comes from the word khilafa in Arabic, and khilafa shares the same root word with khalifa, and khalifa means successor. The concept of caliphate came in the year 632 AD, and that was after the Prophet's death. Um, afterwards, his companion Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, was appointed caliph. He was, the early Muslims basically pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq as their first caliph. Um, the, ca the caliphate then went, um, when the Umayyad dynasty took over, so then it became an Umayyad caliphate, it then became an Abbasid caliphate afterwards, and at some point during the Abbasid caliphate, there were three competing caliphates at the same time, and then there was the Ottoman uh, caliphate until it was dissolved in the post-World War I um, in 1924 in particular, the caliphate was abolished and it broke down into um, Muslim countries, most of which occupied by European uh, countries. Why am I saying all that? Um, basically just to highlight that for 1300 years, almost 1300 years, the caliphate has been the polity that represents the Muslims. Um, and only from 1924 until today that there wasn't a caliphate in place. So flash forward to the post 9-11 attacks. Um, Taliban had been at that time for five years 
uh, governing actually in Afghanistan and they call it the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and they were dreaming and having that goal of reviving the caliphate with their own approach. But they were crushed um, in the post 9-11 attacks by the U.S. and coalition forces, and thus Al-Qaeda was emerging uh, and taking center stage at that time, especially after the attack that it had conducted, and it became at the foreground of that movement by armed groups to revive the caliphate through those abhorrent approaches. Um, so at that time, really, you see a lot of militant groups pledging allegiance to Al-Qaeda, changing their names, becoming regional affiliates of Al-Qaeda in uh, several places. And during that time, bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda at the time, um, when some of those regional affiliates were interested in declaring uh, statehood because they had controlled some territory, he was against the idea. He was more of a gradualist. He thought of um, fighting the far enemy represented by the US and the West first and uh, winning the hearts and minds of Muslims so that when you declare a state, um, it can sustain itself and take you towards the goal of achieving or attaining or reviving a caliphate. But some of the regional uh, uh, affiliates did indeed declare statehood or at least operated statehood projects in some capacity, and they failed eventually because of the, um, in, in face of uh, conventional military uh, forces. At that time, Al-Qaeda had developed sort of a media, media structure that has media organizations representing the affiliates. It had a media organization representing the center. Um, and out of those, apart from AQI, which is Al-Qaeda in Iraq that I'm going to be talking about in a second, AQAP was, the, was and still is the strongest uh, affiliate. AQP is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and it's based in Yemen. And um, their al malahim media was the most, and is still the most uh, prominent in that media structure. Um, malahim media had different, different networks, uh, global network, reaching them by English language uh, publications like Inspire, which probably you might have heard of, and it was started actually by an American. And they had also Arabic uh, language publications uh, to Arabic speakers in the region and beyond. Um, while the experiences of three of the affiliates had failed, AQI had a very different experience. AQI was operating under Al-Qaeda for some time, and then in 2006, it declared itself an Islamic state of Iraq. So again, here, declaring statehood. Um, even though it didn't have any territory, didn't have any capacity to govern by any means in, in Iraq. And then after that, in 2013, when they gained some power, they started actually um, expanding to Syria and declared themselves an Islamic state of Iraq and the Levant, which uh, Ashem, which is the Levant. And that, of course, angered AQI, the mother organization, which led to them disavowing um, uh, Al-Qaeda and eventually ISIS declared the caliphate. And interestingly enough, um, the caliph, his name was Abu Bakr, which is reminiscent of the name of the first caliph of the Muslims, even though his name is not Abu Bakr. That was just uh, a nickname, an alias sort of thing. Um, to complement that caliphate or that um, uh, caliphate project, there was a very sophisticated media system in place with a central media organization uh, acting sort of like a ministry of information. And then there were also um, central media organizations uh, putting out media products. And then they were also overseeing provincial uh, media offices provincial media offices that get uh, products out of the territory that ISIS claims. Um, visuals emerged as the most prominent and the most uh, frequent uh, media products coming out of there, especially still imagery, um, whether in publications or as standalone products. And there was also that same segmentation strategy where there is a global network that you reach them by English language magazines, by Russian, by French, but in Turkish and German. And then for the Arab speakers, there was a Nabat newsletter, uh, which interestingly enough is the only one standing as of today. Uh, it comes out every Thursday, it's weekly, and all the other ones have discontinued already. So the research questions, that I pose here are how does ISIS, or how did it project an, an, an image of a state through its both, both its, uh, the global network and the local, 
network by looking into the publications that are targeting English speakers and others targeting Arab speakers. And on the other hand, since Al-Qaeda was at center stage at some point, um, and it was dreaming of attaining or reviving a caliphate, so when another competitor declares a caliphate, so how are you going to project yourself? What is the image that you're going to be projecting uh, yourself with? Um, for that, I've used the Montevideo Convention as a criteria for statehood. And in a nutshell, the Montevideo Convention basically says that if you have a government in place, if you have territory, if you have population, if you have capacity to enter into relations with other states, then you are actually one, even though if you're not recognized uh, by others. Um, David Kilcullen argues that ISIS had met during its peak had met the four criteria. Well, the first three are understandable, but the fourth is a little bit tricky. So what he argues is that he says by the fact that ISIS was engaging in the black market for selling antiquities and oil to um, neighboring countries, some of the neighboring countries, allegedly, then it meets that criteria as well. So extracting from those criteria, visual categories to investigate in the, the media products that I looked into, um, we looked, I looked into social services, law enforcement, economy, public information apparatus as representation of government. Um, I looked into natural landscapes and, mass as, uh, and maps as representation of territory and the pledges of allegiance as representation of expanding populations and, um, and uh, expanding populations and growth. Um, with regards to the methodology, what my team and I did is analyze uh, almost 3,500 still images manually um, that appeared in Dabiq, the English language, in Naba, the Arabic language from Daesh, and then the Arabic language from Al-Qaeda, since that one is uh, the most up-to-date, because Inspire, the English one that remains, stopped in, um, in 2017. Maybe it come out later, maybe not. Um, and we used, there were three coders involved in that analysis. So starting with Dabiq, real quick, the Dabiq had uh, 20 uh, images per issue on average um, visualizing statehood. I have to point out as a disclaimer that the next slide might have an image that may be disturbing to some. So starting with the criteria of governance, um, the most prominent statehood category that ISIS was hammering on was law enforcement. It was projecting itself as an entity that enforces Sharia law rather than man-made laws. So it would have images of a court that it says in the textual context that this is applying Sharia law. It would have the public engaging in public stoning of, an, uh, of a woman for committing adultery and saying that this is in accordance with Sharia law. It would have members uh, of the group going out there in the, in the territories that, it, that, it, that it's present in and confiscating and burning um, uh, the prohibited materials like cigarettes and, and alcohol and drugs and so on and so forth. Um, with social services, that was also another very prominent category of statehood images um, focusing on healthcare, so showing how they are providing healthcare to locals, um, how it is providing education, how it's installing infrastructure, how it's providing aid. Um, with regards to public information, creating that image that you as a self-declared state is, is give, is, is, is in, uh, owns a public media apparatus that is able of sustaining itself rather than depending on the media, so it was constantly promoting its media products uh, in Dabiq. And with regards to economy, even though it was not as much as the other uh, categories under governance, but nevertheless it was still there, and the very interesting thing is that it was hammering on uh, the return of the gold dinar. The gold dinar they claim um, was introduced by the Umayyad Caliphate as a currency that is, uh, that is for the Muslims at the time in the 7th, uh, 7th and 8th century. And they are basically saying, well, a caliphate is in place now, so why not have, why not have our own currency other than depending on currencies out there? 
um, shifting gears to territory, um, Dobek was projecting that image of a serene territory that they are um, that they possess and that they control, ranging from sunsets and sunrise and rivers, but also mundane cityscape images of uh, gates to cities that have ISIS flags on them and uh, names of provin uh, provinces that it has given to those areas. Um, maps was also another tactic of projecting that image of uh, territory. Um, and interestingly enough, the maps were borderless. So in here, you see the implicit or actually explicit challenging of the nation state borders and creating that image that the self-declared caliphate can expand and you should expect it to expand based on power. And then with regards to the population and the, and the expansion and capacity to enter interrelations, you see images varying from social uh, security forces in Iraq and Syria pledging allegiance and shifting sites to join um, ISIS. You see tribes, local tribes pledging allegiance. You see distant militants joining, so projecting that image that the population is indeed expanding. Um, with regards to Annaba, to a lesser extent, the focus was on statehood, but nevertheless, there were still four uh, images at, on average per issue. Um, and in there, you see that the focus is on physical territory. It's not on governance. It does not project an image of a functional government, but rather it projects an image of physical territory and contestation. And unlike Dabiq, which is saying this is the territory we control here, they are projecting um, that idea that they are fighting over territory and that you should expect them to attain that, uh, that territory eventually. Um, and then again, there were no borders in here. Interestingly enough, in the very rare cases that they account for borders, you see like in that image in here, they say uh, a disclaimer uh, that this is the Jordanian artificial borders. So even when they account for it, they're actually dismissing it in a sense. And as I said, it was limited governance. It wasn't functional government by any means. And you can see that as evident as the, the focus on public information. So you see a tactical shift towards projecting yourself as a virtual state in a sense, where you are operating online. Um, social services was there, but it was not as diverse as it was in Dabiq. So you see you focus only on charity, but you don't see those scenes of education being provided or um, infrastructure being installed in the territories. Um, law enforcement, again, was there, but it was not as as diverse, just focusing on a bunch of executions, but you don't see any uh, systematic um, confiscation and, and burning of particular uh, prohibited materials that they want to uh, crack down on. Um, and then, again, with the expansion of the population, that was very rare. In fact, just two images um, randomly showing distant militants pledging allegiance. So you don't see a population that is expanding by any means. Um, so basically, in one group, which is just Daesh, you see differential statehood arguments. One that is very utopian, providing or projecting an image and romanticizing the image that there is a caliphate in place and that is back, so you better join it. Um, and it's projecting that image of a functional government that enforces Sharia law and that is in accordance with uh, Islam or their interpretation of Islam. And on the other hand, you see a realistic approach, which I also perceive as pragmatic approach because you're targeting at the end of the day Arabic speakers so they are more in close proximity to ISIS so you'd expect that you wouldn't be able to fool people near you as much as people far away because they would be able to determine well this is not on the ground so you're just messing around. Um, shifting gears to Al-Qaeda um, in the Masra newsletter that was even lesser just four images per issue on average, and you see here again, like in Naba, a focus on um, a focus on the public information apparatus even more than the t other two. So you see again that shift towards or the projection of a virtual state in place, sort of. Um, there was very limited governance, even though you see law enforcement being at 19%, which may seem as quite a lot until you look closely at the images. So in here, you see in the middle a Romanian hostage in the hands of AQIM in North Africa. On the right, you see the execution of alleged spies in Somalia by uh, al-Shabaab. On the left, you see the execution of magicians in 
uh, in Yemen. But as I said, when you look close enough, the most of the images are in fact tar focusing on the other, the incompetency of the other. You'd be interested to see the focus on the US. So here you see images in Al-Qaeda magazine talking about the police brutality against African-Americans. You see um, um, images of protests against uh, law enforcement in the US. You see Guantanamo Bay and the, tec the textual context talking about the oppression of the US and its prisons. Um, and then social services, the same, was some of them, of course, showed some infrastructure installation, showed some uh, religious education projects, but again, that was compared to uh, failure of, of uh, countries that are deemed as developed. So as far as going back to first responders in the Pentagon after the 9-11 attacks, like the image on the very right, to wildfires in Tennessee at the bottom left, saying that firefighters are not competent enough to control the fires. But we, as Al-Qaeda, have social services. Um, and then with regards to economy, the vast majority, almost all, were just focusing on the other again. Seeing a McDonald's image in Al-Qaeda magazine, um, and the textual context talks about Saudi Arabia and the collusion with the US and how the crown prince is uh, uh, making fun of him and saying he's the pledger of, he pledged allegiance to McDonald's. And then you see a currency of Saudi Arabia where the textual context also complements that idea of collusion by saying that Saudi Arabia is the milky cow of Trump for offering billions of dollars in deals where in fact they could be spending those money on Muslims that are in, that are in need. Um, and then with regards to territory, again, the two tactics, but two very interesting differences emerged. First, the images of the maps where um, the borders were in place. So you're not challenging the nation state borders in those maps. The second thing was unlike the Daesh, which is always projecting itself on the offensive and showing the maps of territory that it either controls or is contesting over and are gonna control eventually, the images here were taking a victimhood perspective. So you see on the left an image of uh, the map of Libya and then the textual context says the West is invading Libya and harming Muslims. You see a map of Myanmar and talking about Muslims who are being persecuted uh, there. And then, um, Again, as in Naba, you see a very limited capacity to expand the, the, the population that they claim to control. Just random images of uh, um, a tribe in, 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 uh, in um, Somalia pledging allegiance or distant militants in Afghanistan switching sides to Al-Qaeda. So what emerges here is that after ISIS declared its caliphate, you see that Al-Qaeda, in order to respond, it was uh, presenting a dichotomous us versus them visual rhetoric where they are focusing on delegitimizing the world order and creating that image of uh, governance crisis in the developed world. And while not presenting themselves as a functioning government by any means, but they are still presenting themselves as vanguards for uh, that idea of a caliphate that could be attained in the future. And here, back to the question that I posed in the title, actually, or the, the, the headline was, how many, ca is it one caliphate or more? Definitely there are more than one caliphate. There are actually more than one caliphate within the same group, depending on the audience group that you're targeting. Um, you've seen the utopian caliphate in the English language products with a realistic version of the caliphate in the Arabic language uh, products. And that utopian caliphate, now that the territory almost all territories is, is, is lost, um, is no longer attainable for now until they attain territory. Um, however, over the past few years, what they've done really is put out both ISIS and Qaeda, thousands and thousands of media products. And what those products did is that they created the digital repository uh, of content that can be constantly recycled and repackaged to, um, to project to or sustain that image um, and thus, the statehood argument, even though they are not on the ground controlling things, but it's still enduring. And that has very um, dangerous implications. When Benedict Anderson talks about nationalism and he talks about how 
the press, uh, the press was used to create imagined communities. And he said that those imagined communities was the, at the core of nationalism in the 16th and 17th century. So essentially, as an American, you feel you are a part of a larger assemblage, um, the US, and even though you don't see everyone in the US. So militant armed groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, what they are doing, they are using the online environment rather than the press, they're using the online environment to create imagined caliphate. And when you create an imagined caliphate, and when you sustain that image, and when you have firm believers of that caliphate, it's not really hard to prioritize other actions. So at some point, Daesh was calling on people to come and join and immigrate. That was the most prioritized action. But now, the you see another action happening, and what better and more tragic example to, to highlight other than the Sri Lanka attacks. That image on the top is of the um, eight suicide bombers uh, in Sri Lanka. The, the image was put out just two, two days ago and they basically pledged allegiance and they went there and killed over 300 people. Um, there's not a caliphate on the ground, like a revived caliphate on the ground, but they sure believe in that. Why would they do something like that if they don't believe in a caliphate? And what that, what that prompts is a dire need for counter-messaging even if the territory is lost. Because territorial defeat is not necessarily ideological defeat. Um, so counter-messaging has to keep uh, going in a sense. And um, in that sense, given that there are segmented strategies that those groups use, then it's not a one message fits all. If you're putting an alternative narrative or counter-messaging, it cannot just be one size fit all. It has to be segmented in the same sense. And finally, um, alternative narrative, as we've seen, like the invocation of the name of Abu Bakr as a caliph, uh, reminiscent of the first caliph of the Muslims in the seventh century, and as we've seen in the coins, and as we've seen in the maps, the alternative narratives has to also be embedded in trans-historical meta-narratives. Um, that can, and this is this is definitely a very big conversation that I'm barely scratching the surface. But that could be done perhaps by faith-based popular culture products, entertainment education in the the regions that um, ISIS followers are actually carrying out attacks, and in educational projects as well. Um, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming, and thank you, um, Nadia and Andre, for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful so far to exchange some ideas, uh, not only about um, ISIS, but just about our work in general. Um, I have to confess uh, that my work is really not about ISIS, um, so I think uh, Karim did a, a really wonderful job of giving you um, a lot more information and, and a and a very interesting analysis about the ISIS phenomenon. I take a different approach. Um, uh, and I hope that this is not uh, going to be uh, totally irrelevant. I'm reminded uh, when I was going through my baccalaureate exam in, back in my native country, Morocco, many years ago, that there was a joke going on uh, about a, a student who prepared for the history exam. Um, he was supposed to prepare both on China and Japan, uh, and he decided that he was going to only to study China, hoping that the exam was going to be on China. But then he comes to the day of the exam, and the question is actually on Japan. And then he says, um, let's, for the sake of this exam, pretend that China is Japan, right? <laughs> and then he proceeds to do that. Hopefully, this is not going to feel that way. Uh, that's not my <laughs> intention. Um, so my work is not about ISIS. Uh, it's not on about the political strategies of ISIS or the communication tactics necessarily of ISIS or the religious contestations of ISIS uh, or uh, the security concerns uh, raised by the specter of ISIS in the Middle East um, and around the world. I am 
as much uh, repulsed and revolted by the violence as anybody else. But I use ISIS in a much wider reflection on the proliferation of despicable violence um, and the vulgarity of visceral responses to dehumanization as a way to think about the long-standing injuries of subjection of the post-colonial psyche and individual. Meaning, what happens to a person when their humanity and their natural evolution um, as a human being is denied, interrupted, or even worse, truncated? When the very possibility of life with dignity and with a sense of epistemic liberty is forcefully stripped in the name of benevolent empires who employ torture in the service of truth, displacement under the banner of security, drone attacks um, in the service of truth, um, I'm sorry, drone attacks to hide the atrocity of killing, and brutal dictatorship to halt autonomy and self-governance. This is an old story in new guises new tricks, and of course, new grammars of exploitation and dispossession, and also new manifestations of violence. So the questions that I ask are questions about what do we do with this violence? How do we understand this violence besides just revolt and repulsion, uh, which I think are natural uh, instincts for us all to feel once we see an attack in Sri Lanka or an attack elsewhere. But who is the subject of our pity and who is not the subject of our pity, I think is the questions that I'm asking. And I want to start with something that is not related to ISIS, but I think it's important for us to understand in the context of what I call the dehumanization. And I'm not uh, you know, coining this term. I use this term from uh, my background in post-colonial theory, particularly around the work of Franz Fanon, which I'm going to talk about um, just about um, in, a, in a just a few minutes. So um, here is when the subaltern actually is able to reverse the story of dehumanization, right? This is a philosopher out of Senegal who is the father of this negritude movement um, and uh, in the 20th century and was also uh, the president of Senegal for about 25 years, right? And uh, here he is writing back in 1939, he's writing an article called What the Black Man Contributes. And he's basically questioning the Cartesian model, right, of the cogito, right? Uh, I, you know, I think, therefore, I am. He's saying, no, actually, there is another way of knowing the world, and that world is dance. And he proceeds to talk about dance as also another way of knowing the world. Now, today, we celebrate the idea that the division between, you know, the mind and body is something that it has been uh, not only erroneous, but has been misleading and has been... Uh, actually oppressive for a lot of people who have been told there's only a rational way of seeing the world. And here he is in 1939 doing that and questioning his French interlocutors who happened to be some of the most prominent French philosophers uh, as he was a student in a French university, right? Here is a Nigerian philosopher who is questioning Kant and Kant's idea of cosmopolitan ethics and rights and he says, uh, yeah, wait, wait a minute. Uh, we need to also reconcile Kant, the racist, with Kant, the theorist, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the enlightenment theorist, right? Um, so how can we um, deal with that past also, with that history, that at the heart of what we call modernity and we call the enlightenment, there is also a racist heritage. Uh, Kant was known for having... Uh, led the series of uh, lectures uh, at the university where he talked about the racial class classification in which he placed the black person and the, you know, the Native American uh, at the bottom of that rank, and of course he put the white person on top, right? So here it, there is this Nigerian philosopher who uh, uh, unfortunately died uh, just a few years ago at a very uh, early age, and he's, he, he publishes this essay in order to challenge that record, right? what we consider to be at the heart of what we call today modernity. And finally, we have all read The Stranger. How many of you have read Albert Camus' Stranger? All right. Well, if you remember from the story of The Stranger, the story of Meursault, right? the French guy who ends up, ends up killing an Algerian on the beach, 
But we don't know who this Algerian is. We don't know his name. We don't know his history. We just know that he was killed by this French. And the story of the killing of that person, right, ends up being insignificant because that person is nameless, is without history, right? And so this Algerian journalist and author decides that he wants to actually challenge that, uh, the, the supremacy of that story. And then he wrote another story, which actually, which is from the vantage point of the brother of the Algerian who actually was killed. Okay? So in, an, another way of uh, re, you know, uh, uh, reconstituting the, the record in a way that is fair and where the subaltern is also able to speak. Now, why am I saying this in the context of ISIS? I'm saying these things because I think that this is what happens when you have a certain um, level of epistemic availability or semantic possibility, that you have a facility of language, right? Um, I think we, we, all of us can defend ourselves, right? We could talk about things that bother us, and we have a, a variety of options that uh, under our, our disposal in order to redress uh, things that we see are not working in our world. But the challenge here is what happens when you're, you're rendered semantically muted or made to believe epistemically disqualified. Your way of seeing the world is not valid. In the lived experience of the black man, which is chapter five of Black Skin, White Masks of Frantz Fanon, Fanon showed a d deep frustration with a white man, he says, who has woven him out of a thousand details, anecdotes, and stories, prompting him to constantly ask questions like, where do I fit in? Where should I stick myself? Who am I? And his answer, Fanon's answer, he says, well, since the other does not want to recognize me, there is only one answer, to make myself known. How? Well, Fanon conceived of violence as one way of actually making yourself known. But he was not promoting violence. He said, when you are reduced to violence, that's what's actually happened. When you're dehumanized, that's the instinct that we go in as human beings. And Fanon also said very famously, and I quote, I was made to give, but they, this, but they prescribed for me the humility of the cripple. Right? So I was made to give. I had so many things to say, so many things to give, but I was made to believe that I was only someone who is epistemically, again, as I said, irrelevant. Fanon was writing in the 1950s, uh, and yet his insights about the trauma of race, he called it actually as such, and the humanization of what, or what he called the zone of non-being, when you, you are a non-being, where you have to still fight for your humanity ring as true today as they did then. The question of recognition and our deafness to the morbidities of dispossession and the dark side of empire are here to haunt us almost every day. Scenes of abject violence as the apocalypse of hope are a sobering reminder of the cost we pay for failing to look or not daring to make the right historical associations for continue to racialize the other and deny them equality and ontology or their ability to make their own history. As Ann Stoller, um, who wrote this book, Colonial Debris, a few years ago, she said, what happens when the rot of colonialism and coloniality, and I would also add of brutal dehumanization, what happened when that rot remains? When the ruins, turn into ruination, right? How do we read something like this, right? We feel probably disgust. We feel utter um, repulsion, right? That people pick up arms in order to kill others um, indiscriminately, right? And, and again, as I said, those are natural things to feel, right? And I chose very carefully what to show you. There are more, much more viscerally um, disturbing pictures to, to choose, but I do not want to um, play the game of ISIS and, pl and, and play those, uh, those pictures. So I'm showing other things here just to give us a sense of the world that we're dealing with, right? 
Um, and Anne Stoller in Colonial Debris, when she says, what happened to that rot, right? To me, this is the rot of coloniality that we are dealing with. In the same way that when Nadia was talking earlier about Fawaz, right, who says that ISIS is actually a problem of the crisis of governance. For me, ISIS is actually the, uh, the embodiment of the traumatic experience in a region that has not been able to get over yet its traumatic experience of dehumanization and, and where decolonization has not actually worked very well, right? So how these scenes, right, haunt our silent memories and expose our pathologies of forgetting in a hypermediated world that promises us abundance information. Like you can go online and you can find all kinds of information, right? Yet we're unable to understand and comprehend exactly what's happening. Why? Why is it that in this world of abundance of information, we're unable to understand? The spectacle of violence of ISIS cannot simply be understood as a religious contestation or as an example of cosmic vengeance. We almost say, oh yeah, these Muslims again. You know, why can't they just become modern like everybody else and then put religion aside? Why can't they think about this, right? That's, that's the kind of a, a natural, uh, I would say a natural, but that's almost like an expected uh, reaction. Neither can we explain the parades of pain and suffering at the borders of Europe or the United States, right? When we see these kinds of pictures, we also ask questions about how did we get here? How, is, how can we live with something like this, right? And again, I could have shown you much worse uh, pictures, but then so that we don't spectacularize violence, um, we need to be diligent about what we show and how we engage with these pictures so that we don't engage in some sort of a trifling of the tragedy that, that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And what we can see here is something that should haunt us into thinking, why do we accept something like this that is happening? And why are we not doing something about it sitting here in Denver thinking that, well, that's happening thousands of miles away. I'm not concerned about that. This is not my problem. I'm not responsible for it. Well, I, um, for me, these, these are pathologies, right, that are partially caused by the privilege of our ignorance, the recklessness of our innocence. Innocent is, innocence is irrelevant. This, this much we learned from Fanon in the experience of colonization. And our supposed forgetfulness. That we say, oh, well, I forgot how this is related to colonization in Africa and the dispossession of Africa or the putting at the top of these African government people or, or of Middle Eastern government people who continue to terrorize their own populations. Just an example of this um, lack of justice in where we direct our pity sometimes, right? How many of you knew, for example, that 63 mosques were destroyed in Gaza in the last two years. Okay, right? Two people. Yet, <laughs> a blaze in Notre Dame generates so much outrage, and I was outraged too, that it generated a billion and a half dollars in the space of one week. People were writing checks like they were just, you know, um, giving them away, basically. Money, 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 money uh, for something like this, right? So for me, the problem is not whether we should feel sad that Notre Dame is, under, is on fire, but that it produces a hierarchy of who's worthy of our pity and who can pity and who cannot, right? Why is it that the 63 mosques in Gaza never generated any pity? that we don't even know that this, something like this is happening. This is reckless because it assumes, as Charles Mills writes, a kind of white ignorance that has been able to flourish all these years because a white epistem epistemology of ignorance has safeguarded it against the dangers of an illuminating blackness or redness, protecting those who for racial reasons have needed not to know. I don't need to know, right? And then this is where I turn to the concept of colonial aphasia. What is colonial aphasia? It might sound like this weird word and that I'm reaching you know, into the trunk of obscure uh, language in order to come up with something, but it actually gives us something really interesting to think about. Aphasia 
is a process of radical disassociation that renders colonial history and its repercussions of ruination so unspeakable and simply too difficult to comprehend. We don't even have the language to speak about this history. Right? We find ourselves at, at the loss of words to explain exactly what happened or what events or how they connect to one another. So it creates this kind of confusion, a semantic confusion altogether. And this is not a passive form of amnesia, but a deliberate act of forgetting, of evading history, not to be marred by its scars and burdened by its monstrosities. This is the quote from uh, Anne Stoller. But forgetting and amnesia are misleading terms to describe this guarded separation and the procedures that produced it. Aphasia, I propose, is perhaps a more apt term, one that captures not only the nature of that blockage, but also the feature of loss. Calling this phenomenon colonial aphasia is, of course, not an appeal to organic cognitive deficit among the French. He's, he's just talking in, in the context of French uh, uh, post-colonialism. Rather, it is to emphasize both loss and access and active dissociation. In aphasia, an occlusion of knowledge is the issue. It is not a matter of ignorance or absence. Aphasia is a dismembering, a difficulty speaking, a difficulty generating a vocabulary that associates appropriate words and concepts with appropriate things. Aphasia in its many forms describes a difficulty retrieving both conceptual and lexical vocabularies, and most important, a difficulty comprehending what is spoken. Right? So this labor of forgetting, we work to forget because some people want us to forget. This labor of forgetting by absenting the history of coloniality and its repercussions in school curricula, in national conversations, they lead us to the, so these kind of questions about how colonial history is still not addressed in any significant ways, not even by the scholarly community of France or many other country, countries, or let's think about the history of you know, of uh, the genocide here at the founding of, or at the, uh, uh, um, uh, the discovery of the new world, right? Sort of how, do we have the language to speak about these things? Do we have the comfort to speak about these things? And we are sitting actually on native land as we speak, yet we don't have the language to be able to speak about it, or at least we're deaf to it, right? And that deafness to me is loud. It is this suspension between knowledge and ignorance about coloniality and its aftermath that should be of great concern to us, all of us, because incomprehensibility is manufactured and produced, not innocently exper experienced, particularly in a hypermediated world, again, as I said, where information is accessible in magical volumes. Yet we lose our semantic ability to understand, to speak of the morbidities of empire, the footprints of predation and dispossession are, are there, yet we are not comfortable talking about them or we don't have, again, the lexicon to verbalize them and therefore to see them, to feel them, to touch them, and worse, to comprehend them. These are, this is what, what I mean by the rot or what Ann Stoller talks about when the rot turns, um, is, is there and it gets worse or when the ruin turn into ruinations, right? This is, this is Yemen, one side of the horrible war in Yemen led by Saudi Arabia with the support of many Western powers. This is Syria. We know the tragedy, or maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe we need that lexicon again to associate or connect these things together. This is Gaza, right? This is Benghazi in Libya. This is Egypt with Sisi after we thought uh, months of uh, demonstrations in Tahrir Square were going to rid Egypt of that history only to come back to a even more dictatorial regime under uh, Sisi and under this military dictatorship. This is Algeria. And that sign in Arabic, Algeria just was able to dissuade its leader of many years who wanted to go for a fifth term, even if he had 
all kinds of diseases. He couldn't speak, he had a heart attack, he had diabetes, he had cancer, but he still wanted to go for the fifth term. And, and this demonstrator here says, "My, I am 30 years old, 10 years I spent under terrorism, and 20 years I spent under Bouteflika, who is the president, who now has been dissuaded by uh, a group of demonstrators not to go forward with a fifth term, uh, with a, a run for a fifth term um, as the president of Algeria. This is Morocco, where, again, when I speak about dehumanization, right, there was uh, uh, demonstrations in the east of, of Morocco, uh, the northeast of Morocco, that were very, um, very much not talked about in, in uh, generally in mainstream media. Um, and, and they were all about the dignity of um, having a life that is decent, that having a life that where you could, you know, f feel that you are a full person as opposed to always having someone truncate that ability for you to uh, self-realize and to self-actualize your dreams. And uh, the person that is shown in this cover of a magazine uh, is the one who led that movement, which was a completely peaceful movement. Yet this person has been given a sentence of 20 years in prison just recently, All right? And here again, we see that dehumanization that is continued in a way that makes it impossible for people to imagine life with dignity in the same way that we expect of every day. This is Saudi Arabia, right? We know what happened after uh, Jamal Khashoggi, right? The journalist of Saudi Arabia was dismembered and killed in Turkey. And we, you know, I, I don't think it's a mystery who was behind this, but we live as if nothing had happened. Right? You can kill your journalists, that's the message. Kill your journalists, kill your, uh, your uh, demonstrators, kill your civil servants, because at the end of the day, we continue. The march continues, the march of dictatorship continues, and the march of dehumanization continues. Now, I would like to uh, end with just a, a thought about how ISIS, again, whether we like it or not, reminds us of the things that we forgot. Right? And the way in which they use the media, the way in which they use the videos, the images, the, uh, the, the imagery, the verbal or visual imagery of their texts is very, very uh, telling about why is it that they go through the length of showing us that violence has to be spectacularized for us to understand. This is uh, Marwan Kreidi, who's a media studies scholar, and he says, Global networked affect, it, this is the, the phenomenon that he says ISIS is engaging in. It's a networked affect. It's about the affectivity of violence, something that has to hit you viscerally, right? He says, is projectilic, mimicking fast, le lethal, penet uh, penetrative uh, objects, building on scholars who discussed images, weapons, or images as weapons, and image munitions, in, as in ammunitions from representational perspective. Just talking just about representation doesn't help or is not enough. This article, the article that he wrote uh, for this, proposes that approaching the topic via a combination of icon iconology, new media phenomenology, spectacle, and affect theory is better suited to understanding the role of digital images as operative and not only representational in contemporary co conflict, that the image becomes like a missile, like a projectile that hits us in order to make us remember. It does not justify the violence, but it makes us remember exactly that which we are readily um, uh, forgetting. And I think that that's the, uh, the, the, the danger, is when all politics becomes visceral, becomes affective, as opposed to um, about uh, building something instead of just destructing something, just in, instead of destroying things in such a way that it becomes impossible for us to have a politics of recognition or a politics of existence in it itself. So the question comes back to me always is, why do people go through the pains and through the, the tragedy and the atrocity of what they do instead of just showing repulsion at this? We need to ask those kinds of questions and wrestle with them for a while to understand exactly why phenomena like ISIS actually exist. Thank you. Thank you to both of our speakers. Actually, I will invite Karim back to the podium as well since we'll now open the floor for 
questions to both of them, and I have a microphone to pass around. Well, thank you, uh, the organizers and, and both the speakers. Uh, I found uh, this very moving, uh, and of course, uh, thought-provoking, uh, as well as uh, emotionally uh, disturbing, which is probably the way it should be. Uh, and uh, let me preface the question I'm going to ask uh, with a story. I actually had a conversation with Shakespeare. Uh, this is not uh, uh, William, but Frank. Uh, those who study history of media might know that Frank Shakespeare during the Cold War was one of the uh, most powerful media people in the world. He was the chief of United States Information Agency. And uh, uh, my uh, other democratic socialist colleagues and, and myself, we asked him about uh, this propaganda and counter-propaganda. Uh, and he was surprised, frankly, to, to see that we actually knew so much about uh, not just the history of Cold War, but US history and history of indigenous people <laughs> and extermination, et cetera. So, but he was a very intelligent person, I must say. He looked at us, smiled, and said, oh, you are really asking me a philosophical question, aren't you? You are asking, is my truth your truth? Or is your truth my truth? So, and, and this is the question I have, because uh, uh, we uh, have learned a lot uh, uh, through postmodern analysis of media. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, at least there can be two varieties. Uh, we are all postmoderns now, because that's the condition. Uh, but there could be a cynical postmodern modernism, uh, which uh, essentially uh, uh, looks at the society of spectacle and uh, kind of tells us to get along with it. You know, look and forget and look at new things, uh, new stimuli, and, and get to a hyper reality, right? To use Baudrillard, yeah. for example. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, could there be a redeeming sort that could connect with the insights of people like Fanon or, or my own mentor, uh, Amy Cesaire? Um, uh, and uh, could we rediscover, uh, uh, even through, the, you mentioned uh, Emer Stolkontra and Kuth, right? I have used it in my class, actually. Uh, through the use of irony, humor, right? Uh, uh, through uh, storytelling of a different kind, uh, of the sort that you did. Uh, uh, could we find the complexity, uh, not just the surface, but beyond the surface, uh, uh, deeper uh, uh, mechanisms uh, uh, of deception, self-deception of violence and counter-violence, and the history of imperialism, something frankly seems like a taboo word among the liberals, especially American liberals. Uh, I would also like to know how liberals learn how far to go without going too far. Um. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a, a really good insight, and uh, thank you for raising that question. I would say that this is uh, exactly uh, the second part of the work that I'm doing, right? So how do we go from the vulgarity of violence as, as, the, as the only option available to something that is more redeeming, which is about recuperating that voice, right? And M. Césaire obvi obviously did it in interesting ways. But M. Césaire and Fanon and, and many others, and, and you know, W. E. Du Bois and others, did it for their own people. But they had that facility of, again, of knowledge and a facility of expression and of, and of connecting you know, the dots and looking at history and looking at the arc of history in such a way that can al allow them to say the things that they said and to empower their own people uh, beyond just the you know re resorting to violence, but I think uh, Fanon for me is someone who was very uh, instrumental in telling us we have to be very careful, right, about the affectivity of violence when it becomes the only so solution when violence is the ultimate praxis. Right? Because when you take people away from, we take away from people their ability to, to speak, to say things, to realize themselves, and to claim their humanity, obviously that that's the only option that they have left for them, right? Particularly when you're deaf to their grievances, or when their grievances have not been addressed or redressed, right? 
Um, and, I, and I think uh, there is something here even in sort of liberal democracies, right, where everything is built around these politics of recognition. If I only can just say, yes, of course, there has been a genocide, right? Of course, there has been colonization. They think that that's enough, that the politics of recognition is enough, just to say, I, I, I see you, I hear you, but they're not doing anything about it. And so the next thing they say, well, maybe we can do some reconciliation. You know, the work of Glenn Coulthard, for example, who, uh, read, uh, who wrote the book uh, Red Skin, White Masks, right, which is kind of a, an interesting uh, 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 version of, of, of uh, f uh, adapting Fanon to the indigenous uh, question, right, particularly around indigenous resurgence, right, is, is very important in that regard, right? He says, Indigenous people do not necessarily just have to say, you have to see me, right, uh, and, and stop there. But you have to do something else, and that something else is to actually show to the rest of the world that you have a voice, you have a culture, you have a civilization. How do you do it without having the others at the other end of it not hearing you or not seeing you? I think that that's the challenge, is that there are a lot of people who are speaking, who are doing this kind of work, but we're not seeing them, we're not hearing them. Uh, and, and that's the concern, that when people are not heard, they go somewhere else. Because that no, that contestation, has to go somewhere and it didn't go anywhere. Right? Um, <clears throat> I, so I, th I think of it more of a simplification of those ideas uh, that needs to be disseminated in forms of popular culture, in a sense. So those voices that are not heard, I perceive popular culture to be the way to amplify those voices in simpler terms, I would say. Um, and then that could accommodate more, more ideas in the society that fights those um, anti-societal um, thoughts and anti-societal ideas. Um, we've seen that in, I'm, I'm closely following in the Arab world in particular, uh, those underground groups that are actually accommodating religion and, and Dr. Nabil knows way more than me. He's, he's, work, he's done a lot of work on that. Um, but in, in some Muslim countries, religion itself is not being accommodated in the public sphere. And then when you see that extremism in a way where you could be in a Muslim country, let's say, and as a veiled woman, some places might not accommodate you even to have dinner somewhere because they want just everybody not to be veiled. They don't want any representation of religion. Well, where you see that extreme, you'll see another extreme on the other side. Um, and that's, that's the middle ground that, they s that I see or perceive popular culture playing in it, in a sense. Do we have any other questions? Perhaps we can take two or three questions and then So I have two questions. Um, the first one being, uh, you spoke of counter-narratives. Um, I was wondering if you could speak, have you seen any um, data as to success or you know, un unsuccessful counter-narratives that have kind of pushed the battles of the U.S. And, front? and then my second question is seeing that you know, the, the combative dehumanization that we see clearly, uh, I think you speak to it from this perspective of liberal internationalism. So how do you translate that perspective to the U.S. public who recent polling shows that they really aren't liberal internationalists so much anymore, you know, with the, you know, last you know, 10 to 15 years. Should I ask? Okay. So, uh, so I, have, I have some thoughts about Karim, and I want to share with you this, and I want to know your thoughts about that. So when you've been talking about the ISIS individualization, romanticized spirituality of the of the state and the, the modern state thing. So, like, for, from my perspective, that's not something new, because that's how the militaries all over the world have been doing the same thing, by visualizing the most romanticized way, by people jumping and doing this and doing all of these things. And also, that's the same thing as well that we see in the pop culture. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Thanks for coming. Um, I have a question actually about the issue of governance, which um, you, you guys just talked about the crisis of governance at the beginning. Um, but it's interesting when we look around the world at many different um, 
armed groups, we see very different kinds of interactions that they have, both with the people that they interact with locally, but also globally. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of differences even within ISIS al-Qaeda, um, as well as between them, in terms of how they're actually interacting with people on the ground, and sort of the mix of these, these images of who they are, identity creation, imagined communities um, that, are, that are very violent, and how they're actually managing interdependencies you know, in particular localities or with particular kinds of other authorities. Um, so let me let me first start with the with the question about counter messaging um, uh, initiatives that I've seen. There was one called Think Again, Turn Away. I don't know if anybody came across it. That was a few years back. It was done by the State Department. Uh, I don't know what to say about that one, but um, there was there was basically a YouTube uh, channel, and one of their videos actually got like almost a million views. Um, but it was it was a total failure. Um, what they did basically, and that that goes back to the superficial uh, superficial perspective or view of of complex issues going out there, they the video was basically using ISIS own footage. So they're putting footage of ISIS blowing mosques, and then they are saying ISIS is blowing mosques. Duh. Um, they they are showing them killing people, but not showing the final, you know, uh, gruesome scenes, and then saying they are executing people. Well, thank you. Um, so this is again the superficial um, level, and that act, the body that body and the governmental body that actually was in charge of that is is changed its name and had to rebrand itself and everything because of the failure that happened. Um, other stuff that I've seen. Um, I was in a symposium in Vienna, and there was that very interesting initiative, uh, getting mothers of European um, individuals who had traveled to join ISIS, and they were doing interviews with the mothers on camera. Again, back to the, the, the area of work that I'm focused on, which is visuals and visual narrative and visual semiotics and how to you know, uh, move people in a way or prompt people to move or act um, when you are seeing videos, very engaging videos, um, uh, popular culture b tropes being used, and then you're seeing somebody, whether this is a religious scholar talking in front of a camera or a mother talking about what happened, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, it's not visually engaging. And that's what they're capitalizing on. And that moves th to the question that you just asked. ISIS is just one one stage of a chain of uh, propaganda that has been going on since the, the mid-19th century with photography and how it was used in the Mexican War and the posters of World War I and the Nazi propaganda and propaganda that we still see today but we don't call it propaganda because it would you know, give a negative connotation. Um, yeah, so uh, for, for me, I really, I really believe that for counter-messaging, and I, I don't... I would actually, I'm more, I'm more into the idea of calling it alternative messaging because what counter messaging does, it's calling for inaction. What alternative narratives could do is call for alternative action. So they are calling you to do something and other voices are telling you not to do it. But we need other voices to tell you what you could do that can be self-satisfactory but not as abhorrent as what ISIS does something that can build the society, something that can satisfy you in a way. Uh, yeah, I'm going to address the second part of your question because uh, I think the other questions probably were more uh, directed at uh, Karim. Yeah, I think along the lines of what Karim just said about alternative uh, 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 narratives, right? I think uh, the way in which you translate this kind of work here to the U.S. is by seeking out um, alternative narratives of, of, of that region and, and also people who come from that region in this place, right? Um, and, and, and stop engaging even among liberals of what I call unveiling obsessions about 
about the Middle East or about Islam, right? It's all, it's all about revealing the mystery of this world. Even the way in which we speak about the Middle East all the time is this weird place. Uh, you know, it, it has people who, you know, who have been steeped in religion, and we talk about it in mystical terms, that, uh, which is sort of how many uh, scholars have talked about, you know, uh, Edward Said uh, being one of them, this idea of orientalizing that part of the world. But it goes even beyond that. It's also even people who acknowledge the importance of seeing that world differently, they still engage in those same kind of tropes, right? It's sort of, it's, it's about unveiling that world for us to see because we think that that world is so mysterious and hiding something, right? Um, and even in our popular media, uh, right, uh, the reality TV, the first reality TV about Muslims, right, was, was um, uh, you know, the all-American Muslim, right? Uh, it's as if Muslims had just arrived to this country, right? And, and the, the poster of that show shows an, uh, an American Muslim woman veiled, and she's looking sort of from behind the American flag, right? As if she's hiding something, and then she's just peeking up to say, oh, I'm here too, right? Um, these are very important narratives. And this was produced by well-meaning producers, right? And, and, and uh, Hollywood writers who thought, that this is the way to introduce uh, that this segment of the population to the mainstream uh, U.S. public, but it it completely failed uh, because it just showed Muslims to be something of an anomaly in in this society, as opposed to people who have been here. Actually, you know, 30 percent of the slaves that were brought into this country actually were Muslims, right? There are connections between jazz and blues and, and Islam, right? And you know, we have to make an effort to learn about these things. That's why I said the claim of innocence and the claim of ignorance doesn't, doesn't help. Uh, there are people who are doing these kinds of things and we need to pay attention uh, when they speak. And, 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 and they speak to us in, in beautiful language, in beautiful prose and in poetry, and they speak to us in film and many other things, right? Sometimes I cringe when I hear people say, oh, I don't wanna watch that movie, it has subtitles. I'm so lazy to watch with subtitles. You know, I think that that's, that's the privilege of ignorance, right? That's the privilege of ignorance. Uh, not allowing yourself uh, to go at least sort of to, to go through that pain of watching a film with subtitles to understand another part of the world. To me, that's baffling, right? Because many of us had to speak many languages in order to inhabit this world. That's what Fanon was saying. I had to learn French and you know, my, my Creole was not good enough. I had to learn proper French. And when I learned proper French and I thought that I had assimilated, they told me, ah, but you're not really the French of stock origin, right? Um, you know, some, uh, the part of, the, a lot of people in the world actually have done so much just to fit in, you know? I think it's time for the others also to, to make an effort to fit in with the rest of the world, as opposed to just having that one-way street where I don't think we are necessarily going to get anywhere. Yeah. So, so with with regards to the crisis of government that we touched upon today, um, I wouldn't have much insights on the ground, of course, but from uh, things that I've read. So, a scholar, a Syrian scholar with much access in Syria, he's, he's in DC, but he has a lot of access there. He wrote an article and was talking about how ISIS, when it moved in, in parts of Syria, people were actually happy. And people were happy not because they are on board with ISIS ideology, people were happy because there was no security. And here's that force coming in there that can enforce security, however it is gonna be, but at least they'll feel more secure. So they were on board. And then there was, New York um, Times article by a journalist, uh, Rukmini, uh, which basically talks about how, it's called the ISIS files, it's a very interesting feature. And it talks about how people in Iraq, after the defeat of ISIS, they are actually yearning for the days of ISIS in terms of infrastructure. Because they are saying <laughs> that before ISIS, the Iraqi government was not providing a water, water would, would not be available for days and it would come at certain hours and stuff like that. But when, when ISIS came, as per the people that were interviewed, um, they actually forced the, 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 the workers to work 
they were brutal if they don't work, of course, but well, they were infrastructure. So people were actually yearning for that because once they were defeated, the Iraqi government went back to the same old scenario of, you know, abandoning them and well, the infrastructure in them fails. And this is the crisis of governance. Um, same, same, same thing in, in, in other places as well, where they would just be on board just because they are getting some benefits, which are very basic, very basic human rights uh, in terms of to be able to find water or to be able to find electricity or something. And then they have to bear the consequences of, of, of that uh, ideology, but at the same time, they're benefiting. And, and as I said, now that they are gone, um, there's still that frustration with the crisis of governance that it's still ongoing. Any other questions? Again, let's take a couple. That will be our last round. So if you have a burning question, now is the time for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so thank you very much for your presentation. It's very fascinating. I wanted to go to a point that you just made um, about the one-way street. And um, on a practical level and on a concrete level, what are some ways that that can be changed? I think even more broadly speaking, not just in terms of the Middle East, but in terms of dominant fundamental groups, not just hearing stories, but connecting and understanding and, and seeing things and doing things differently, it seems like. There's one thing, there's one thing, it's one thing to raise awareness, which is very important, but then changing that one-way street where Americans who, you know, my area of research is language and multilingualism are one of my interests, and people who come from the dominant fundamental language group typically don't make an effort to learn other languages, for instance. So on a broader level, how do we, how do we change that? Um, are there any specific recommendations? Speak up. <laughs> um, so ISIS has been successful in recruiting um, white men who are considered like part of the dominant group in the West, or are the dominant group in the West. And so I'm wondering if we're connecting the recruitment tactics of ISIS to the disenfranchisement of zone of non-being um, as of almost the rest of the world compared to the, to the West. Why do you think their narrative was compelling to so many white men that packed up and moved from the West? So in case somebody didn't hear, and also for the benefit of our video, the question is, why was the narrative of ISIS compelling to a lot of white men in the West who may not be part of the disenfranchised and silenced group that uh, Nabil was speaking about? One more question? <laughs> um, picking, piggybacking off of that, how do you think that this kind of messaging and this kind of visualization can also apply to the other side of the spectrum with right nationalist groups and how we're able to apply that in a security mindset for everywhere because that's obviously a problem that is becoming more prevalent and more attacks are occurring. Well, uh, I wish I had a recipe. <laughs> I really do. Um, I think uh, academics are very good at diagnosing the problem, not so much at uh, giving solutions. Um, although I would say that um, I will give a, 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 an answer that is inspired by my own world, and, and that is the world of teaching. Um, and I would say that we need to work on the way in which we, for example, construct our syllabi, right? Um, how do we think about this very basic thing that sometimes we think about it in a mechanical way, right? Sort of a syllabus, you curate it in a certain way, you just give it to your students and, and the end of the day. And I think we have a power as teachers, right? I mean, I could speak only about my world here, right? And, 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 and we have a power as teachers really to curate the syllabus in such a way as to expand the horizons of our students beyond, again, as I said, these sort of politics of recognition, right? 
Um, you know, if you are teaching, say, Thomas Hobbes, and you're teaching the Leviathan, well, make an effort and then put the 14th century philosopher from you know, the Arab world, uh, Ibn Khaldun, who also talked about the state of nature and talked about you know, Bedouin life and who moves and who doesn't move, right? Sort of ha uh, pr prepare in your student a sense also of epistemic justice about the world, right? That, that other places have thought about the same questions. That the, the, that the answers to questions of freedom, questions of governance, question of democracy, question of human rights, all these questions are not the province just of Western scholars, right? That there are other people who have thought about it, and not only from the Middle East. They thought about them from China. They thought about it from India, from Pakistan, from um, you know Africa, right? And 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 when you when you assign Kant, as I said, assign also the other side, people who contested the viability of Kant as necessarily the essence and uh, the primordial, you know, yardstick that we use in order to measure everything against, right? Uh, these are small steps, right? And we, we might think that they don't really make a, a huge difference, but I think they do. They really do. Um, and so I, for me, I, I wield the syllabus, um, you know, for the lack of a better word, and I, 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 maybe this is not the right analogy given what we're talking about, as a weapon. My syllabus is the weapon uh, to counteract what's going on here. And, and unfortunately, as academics, we don't really think of the power of the syllabus. So, um, and then of course, pop culture is another way of doing this, right? I mean, think about LGBTQ um, communities and, and, and how popular culture has helped uh, normalize their presence in society. I mean, of course, there are many other problems that are still lingering out there, but just the fact that storytelling also helped naturalize that story and normalize it in the eyes of the average American to accept that way of life as a viable way of life. I think that that's, that's uh, these are small steps, but they lead to something much bigger. We shouldn't concern ourselves with major policy changes necessarily, uh, because those can, you know, they can work or they cannot work. I mean, uh, as Karim was saying, you know, you could, you could have, you could defeat ISIS and thinking that things are going to get, you know, better, except that the population is yearning for ISIS because they provided something much better than you can provide, right? Because you're sloppy in your governance or you are uh, negligent in your governance. So I think the, 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 the big scale answers are not necessarily the answers that we should be looking for. We should also be looking at small scale answers because they, they, they have a, a more everlasting effect. Um, and now I forgot the, the other question. Oh, men. Oh gosh. Um, you're going to get me in trouble here. Uh, men. Well, um, what's that? White men. That's right. Um, <laughs> did you know that the alt-right actually supports ISIS? In the sense that they like what ISIS is doing, but they want ISIS to stay where they are, right? They don't want, to, they don't want them to come into the West. And the reason why they say this is because ISIS reminds them of the virility that, they've, they, that they think they have lost, right? Their state in, in society, their status in society, the, the primacy of the patriarchal world. And they see ISIS as, you know, wielding that power uh, in front of their eyes, and they think that maybe I want that, right? Now, I'm not saying that every white man that joined ISIS necessarily thought that, but I think there's something very compelling about that for, for um, you know, an easily impressionable young kid who thinks maybe that's what I'm yearning for, even if they cannot verbalize it that way, right? Um, and, and that's just part of the answer. It's not the, the entire answer, but um, if you catch me at a better day, maybe I can have a better answer for you. But that's what I'm going to say about that. Maybe Kerim has something else. So I just want to point out that it's, it's not just about grievance. Um, uh, King's College in London they conducted interviews with defectors, people who went there, Europeans who went there and came back. And one of the one of the themes that emerged was adventure. Some of the th other themes that emerged were actually that I'm going there to get my Toyota truck and you know get to marry many women and you know live the dream, live the ISIS dream, you know. Um, so 
the profiling and actually the psychology of terrorism literature has not been able to come up with, uh, with a profile. At some point, the profile in the 90s was white um, uh, uh, mid middle class men. And then after the Intifada, it turned to be more Palestinian and then didn't work. And then they were, okay, it's Middle Eastern, but then it didn't work. And then now it's Muslim writ large and it's not working because then you're going to so say it's a Muslim young man from a impoverished background. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has a PhD. Bin Laden was a millionaire. Zawahiri, the, the, the leader of Al-Qaeda now, was uh, he's a physician or a dentist, something like that. So there is no profile. If we're talking about grievance, it's because we are talking today or focusing more about governance. So that is the, the, the prism. This is the lens that we're looking at it from. Um, and then with regards to white, white nationalism, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Because tying that to the point that Christoph just mentioned, for me, I have language access and I have cultural access to the, the Arab world, in a sense, and I'm still educating myself as much as I can about that. Um, when, when I see Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and I know that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was the first ca uh, caliph, I can draw that connection. If they say a particular, if they use a certain reference, I can tie it in a way, or if I'm not, I can try to figure it out. But about white nationalists, I don't have as much uh, tools to get at it. I can get at it, but I'm better at that part of understanding that part of the world and I'm trying to understand other parts of the world. So this, this is part of the securitization of research that it's focusing only on groups um, um, with, with that, that has Muslims in its ranks, basically. But to the video of Christ Church, I've seen a lot of horrible videos over the past few years and images because of the research I do. But this is one of the most horrific videos I've ever seen. Semiotically, the use of POV shots, which is found in experimental research to prompt identification with the actor. And we see it in video games, you know, Call of Duty, other games that you actually engage in there. I've tried an experiment one day in my digital journalism class, and I showed them uh, POV shots of like stunts over mountains and stuff like that. They asked me to stop midway because of the, of the fear that they felt in there. That 17 minute video, I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, it's all POV. The songs that he's playing inside the car are very carefully um, chosen. What I did is that I got my Shazam app up and then I was listening to the songs in the video and I was trying to figure out what those songs are. One of them was called, I don't know, like Kill Kebab or Hunt Kebab, something like that. I was talking about Muslims as Kebab, that you should just hunt them and eat them. It was very well made and it was horrific. And I think it sent a message, especially with the buzz that, was the, that happened afterwards. Um, but whether, do they have a media structure? I'm not quite sure if, it, if it's as sophisticated as ISIS. Are they lethal? Of course, we've seen that. So. I think also researchers with more access to that um, need to address that as well because it's not just a phenomenon in, 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 the, in the Middle East by any means. I want to thank both of our guests and all of you for the great questions. Um, we need to wrap up, but before we leave, I just want to announce another event um, that's coming up next week on Wednesday, May 1st at noon. And it will be taking place in the Anderson Academic Commons in room 290. Um, it's the annual Mark Margolin Distinguished Lecture. And our speaker for that will be um, political commentator, journalist, and best-selling author Bill Arkin. And the topic is how the news media and the public contribute to perpetual war, which is not unrelated to some of the issues that we brought up today. Before you leave, please help yourself to some more sweets. Um, these are for all of you, so take some, share them with friends, and thank you.